Hi everybody, I'm Michael Sanchez with the Vergers Guild of the Episcopal Church. I recently sat down with retiring Dean's Verger of Lincoln Cathedral, Mr. John Campbell, to talk about his position there. We had a great chat about his duties, some of the history of his ministry, as well as some church history. I hope you enjoy this first part of our interview. <laughs> Hello, Vergers. This is Michael Sanchez. I am here with our uh, VGEC Overseas Liaison, uh, Mr. John Campbell. He is the retiring Dean's Verger at Lincoln Cathedral, and we're really happy to have him here with us. He's, he's uh, graciously allowed us uh, to film our conversation, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, position as well as some other things uh, that we have on our minds to talk to. So, John, thank you for so much for being here today. It's a privilege, and in, in the sitting rooms, it's brilliant, isn't it? Great, great privilege. So, um, John, we just we, we just want to check in with you. You know, how have you and your family uh, fared during this, uh, you know, during this time of, of, of physical distancing? You can, you, we fared brilliantly on every level, on personal and professional. We're, we're three professional people. Our son works away in Coventry but he came home and he teaches so he's been teaching remotely from from Lincoln my wife works in the National Health Service so she works partly from home and partly out in the field and I have the great commute of 30 yards um, 30 meters from my front door to the cathedral front door so I work primarily from home and get into the cathedral to look after the uh, the physicality of it uh, the cathedral isn't closed it's just working differently and we're working out in the community. So that's a great challenge and a great privilege, and we're learning all the time. So it's been a positive, uh, painful experience, but a positive experience. Of course. So um, now tell us a little bit about uh, your, your recent decision to retire uh, from your post that you've been at for many years. Um, when did you make that decision, and, and how did that go about? Well, probably 66 years ago, <laughs> um, when, when uh, <laughs> I came to Lincoln in 1990 for five years and thought, I thought I'd do a tour of duty here for five years and have stayed 30 years, which has been a great privilege to see the cathedral grow and change into a different beast that it was then. Uh, and there's a future. We have something called Lincoln Cathedral Connected, where we've taken on some of our old property back. Uh, that was in secular use and there's a great um, drive forward to mix the sacred and the secular keeping the sacred of the cathedral and having a facility for secular uh, activities and that's about to to open hopefully in October this year COVID permitting so it seems to be a right time to to hand over to somebody younger somebody with new ideas I brought new ideas when I came here in 1990 um, legislation is changing, activities are changing, and we need to go out and meet the world to bring the world into this marvellous pile of stones. So these two buildings will be working together, uh, and the Dean's Verger primarily looks after the sacred part of that, uh, that venture. That is the pile of stones which has stood here since the 1090s, and we want to take that into the 21st century with modern technology, modern ideas, and some younger blood. Of course. So, um, so for those of us who haven't had, you know, the good fortune of, um, of visiting Lincoln Cathedral, can you tell us a little bit more about it? You told us it's been around since the 1090s. Can you tell us about the type of architecture and all those things that, you know, vergers love to talk about with, with respect to buildings and places yeah. of worship? <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect cathedral in a way because it's got the best of everything. Uh, Ruskin said that Lincoln Cathedral was the uh, worth two of any other medieval cathedral in the country. Um, the West Front is Norman, uh, and we go through every stage, through early English, through decorated, through Gothic, um, and, and perpendicular. And we've got the best, I believe we've got the best of everything. Uh, if you ask me to scratch the surface and say which is the, the best cathedral, the purest cathedral in the country, I would say Durham Cathedral, because that's a pure Norman cathedral. But we've got the best. Of, of those those great periods of architecture um, 
and, and, and it is just a pile of stones. Uh, nonetheless, it's a pretty impressive uh, pile of stones. And if you look at the three northern cathedrals, geographically with Lincoln in the south, York in the centre and Durham in the north, um, there's a great contrast with the masculinity of Durham, the mystery of the northern male. In York, you've got the femininity and the brightness of, of, of York Minster. And Lincoln, you've got a great combination of all of those styles where we're not, we're not dark and forbidden, we're not light and fragile, we're a working cathedral. You know, the word naif comes from the Latin navus, a ship to carry someone from one place to the next on a journey from darkness to light. Uh, so I see Lincoln Cathedral not as a cruise ship mainly, uh, but as a cargo ship with a purpose. And it's a working ship. And it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be able to see it being used in many, many different ways in the 30 years I've been here. It's a privilege to work with what I call Yahweh's hardware, the tools of the trade, uh, the, the buckets and the mops, the ladders that often fall down, uh, the chairs that have got to be moved, the stages that have got to be built. But when everything comes together in a great, whether, whether it's a great work of art or a great opus with, a, with an orchestra or an act of worship, it brings together we're a stage, we've got our auditorium, we've got our costumes, we've got our vestments on, the procession starts, the overture of the organ uh, starts and we process in to the great auditorium and we put on a show. And the difference between the theatre and the cathedrals and the churches of our land, the script we've got has got a magic element that we want the message uh, to get over. So yes, it's, uh, it's a multifaceted place from that point of view. So um, you, you, you touched upon briefly um, a, a little bit earlier about some, uh, uh, some programs that, that the church offered, um, one where, where you're reaching out to the secular world in, in particular. Can you give us um, a, a few other programs, either from the sacred or, or the secular, that you're particularly proud that the cathedral sponsors and offers to the, to the community? Yeah, you, you, on, on some simple less, uh, levels, uh, we open our doors every morning uh, at 7.15 and it's sometimes, normally between 6 and 7 in the evening, it's closed sometimes, it might be midnight. So one of the strap lines I like to use is that our mission is to welcome visitors and bid farewell to pilgrims. So that's something that we're proud of, that we give something that perhaps unknown, perhaps isn't recognized for a few years. So on that very simple level of just nodding to someone, smiling to someone, saying good morning to someone, that's a great ministry. Say hello to visitors and turn them hopefully in, into pilgrims. Uh, so another thing that we do quite um, uh, recently, we, we do a program of sacred space um, of people uh, you know, the, the last thing a verger wants when he's done seven services on a, on a Sunday is to open for an eighth service at eight o'clock at night on a Sunday night. But we do that once a month and we just open the space for people to come in. They might experience smell, touch, dance, um, labyrinths, some activity, some practical activity, just silent place. Uh, where people just come in and they be still and know that I am God and, and walk around the building from one activity to the other and having the freedom to join in or not. That's a great privilege for some people. They don't, not everybody wants a structured liturgy and we're pondering uh, that at the moment. Um, we've developed in the past and, and, and working through the present uh, pilgrim tours. So many co people come into our cathedrals today um, and if you want a guided tour, it's often given in the past tense. They used to do this, they would have done that, this would have happened. And with the tours that we develop, the pilgrim tour is saying, this is what's happening today. This is the symbolism of this building. Um, we look at the building as a body. You can come in the doors at the West End as a pilgrimage that haven't walked a long way and, and see the, the, the entrance of the cathedral as the ache and feet of the pilgrim. You can look at the, the nave of the building, which is the torso without which we can't manage. The, the, the blood, the, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, all of the workings of life go on in the nave. And then you come to the cross and if you're privileged enough to have a cruciform cathedral, 
and those outstretched transepts are the arms of Christ hanging on the cross. So there you're at the heart of the cathedral where the pump and blood goes right throughout. If you progress towards the east and to the light, you come into what we have here, brilliant choir, where choral music happens most days. And that is the intellect, that's the brain of the, of the body of this, the church. And then you can go on really far on into the far east end of the cathedral, which in Lincoln Cathedral is called the Angel Choir, and we're surrounded by angels. And that's the intellect, that's the brain, and the, the, the soul and the light which we're, which we're aiming for. So the, the pilgrim tour goes not looking always at stone and glass and wood when they're important, but the symbolism of why the building is built in that sort of shape, why we go from east to west, why in churches you're going up steps to the altar, climbing the new, uh, Calvary to the New Jerusalem. And it's very interesting to note here in Lincoln in particular, this theme was, uh, was, was planted way back in the early 1990s when we collaborated with Hollywood and Ron Howard and Tom Hanks in The Da Vinci Code. And Tom Hanks in The Da Vinci Code was looking for the secrets to find the Holy Grail. And it prompted us to think, look at the secrets we've got in Lincoln Cathedral. And are we really telling people what this place is about? using it as a springboard for the, for the gospel. So we've got a lot to thank Tom Hanks and Ron Howard for, uh, for making us stop and think. Uh, so there are a few things that, that are out of the box of Anglican worship. I'd, I'd like to kind of move us now. Can you give us sort of a, a, a bird's eye view of, of what the position involves? Sort of, you know, your week to week, what things you're, um, uh, you're charged with overseeing, things that you just sort of delegate out to some of the other staff that might be at the cathedral and some things that you're really hands on with. Yeah, uh, being Dean's Verger of the cathedral in lay terms has been the floor manager. Uh, anything that goes on on the floor of the cathedral, uh, I control and organize, whether that's a guided tour, um, whether it's a concert with a massive orchestra of 110 people in an audience of 15 or 1600, uh, a, a, a memorial service, a wedding, the smallest wedding we've ever done here in Lincoln Cathedral was five people, and the biggest one was 1500 people. Mm -hmm. And given the same attention to those two, the two couples, uh, liturgy and not least uh, pastoral ministry through funerals, uh, and sometimes you get very difficult funerals and sometimes you can, and you honestly can have joyful funerals, um, whether you're celebrating the death or more, uh, the life or mourning the death. So coordinating those things, coordinating not only the liturgical side and the secular side, but the legal side from the health and safety point of view, looking at risk assessments and method statements and due diligence of keeping us safe, um, a safe building for all users, which takes us on uh, to safeguard and looking after the safety of all people who come through, whether it's on a practical level, a security level, or an emotional level. Um, and I'm dealing with uh, all different departments, the music department, we have a work staff, a works department here with a staff of uh, about 60 people. So. I don't want the work staff to be driven and bag banging if the organist wants to be practicing something soft, but I don't want the organist playing loud if there's a meditation going on somewhere. So getting the balance and keeping the building open and running smoothly, the floor manager, that is in a nutshell what the Dean's Verger is about. Of course, I don't do it all by myself. I've got a, a team of five other vergers who work with me who are paid, and another six volunteer vergers who help us on great occasions and help us on small occasions. So it comes down to teamwork and understanding and the cue, the, the, the cue in everything we do, I, I believe, is the word communication. Because through good, open communication and knowing that people have understanding what you've said and what you expect and having a, a dialogue, open communication, is incredibly important. 
let's talk about Sunday mornings because I know that uh, a lot of a lot of our our viewers will be very interested to hear how a typical Sunday goes for you. Um, you mentioned that you do uh, seven services on a, on a typical Sunday. Can you can you just give us a laundry list of of uh, what those services are, how they differ from each other, and, and your responsibilities? Yeah, uh, on, on, a, on a regular Sunday, we, we'd have a, a, a minimum of uh, the, the first service is at 7.45, that's the litany. Um, and we say the litany every Sunday, Wednesday and Friday. That's a very small um, but significant part of what we offer. Uh, and then we would have at 8, eight o'clock in the morning, we'd have a, a, a Eucharist, which would be said to the Book of Common Prayer, our 1662 Book of Common Prayer. Um, uh, which so you're talking about the liturgy, um, maybe five or ten people at the eight o'clock, maybe twenty or thirty people. That leads into nine thirty with our choral Eucharist, uh, which would invariably always have the the choir there, and that would be uh, certainly in the Easter season, which we've missed terribly this year with incense and processions and. Uh, and we always have vestments, obviously. So that's the main core, that's the main service at 9.30. Um, 9.30 people uh, have the Ministry of Goodbye where they'll meet for coffee, uh, whilst the 11.30, sorry, the 11.30 people are arriving for, uh, for choral matins. So we have two choral services every, every Sunday morning. Uh, then at 12.30, we have a midday Eucharist, at 12.30, just a said service at the Shrine of St. Hugh uh, for people who really don't want the razzmatazz of great, rich liturgy and uh, deep theological preaching, and, and just a simple said service. And then we do get some lunch in the middle of all that, uh, ready for, <laughs> ready for uh, 3.45, when we gather again uh, for Choral Evensong, and we have Choral Evensong uh, every day of the week, apart from Wednesdays. Um, so that's the large se section of, um, of, of Lincoln Cathedral, but then you could have at 2.30 thrown in there a celebratory service, something for Remembrance Day, something for a Battle of Britain commemoration. The Boy Scouts on St George's Day come, and we have 1,500 rampant woggles and banners and flags. Uh, we can try doing a risk assessment on that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, uh, pretty challenging. Uh, so that's, 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 uh, that's the basic day. Uh, from the litany um, uh, at 7.45 in the morning, through all of those regular services and services to the wider community, and then once a month, closing off at 8 o'clock with sacred space and just being still in that space, having gone through that day of work, is as much a ministry to us who work there as the people who, who come as well. You mentioned a little bit earlier that there are a few services throughout the week. Can, can you go through that uh, throughout the week, just really quickly touch on, on what, what happens? Every, every day, the, the, the community of the cathedral, that's basically the chapter and often the bishop's staff uh, gather at the Shrine of St. Hugh at 7.30 every morning. Mm -hmm. uh, they disperse to their, their jobs, as it were, uh, and then that's always followed by an 8 o'clock Mass, or was said, maybe just four or five people. Um, then we um, the, open the doors to the visitors, we're ostensibly at 9 o'clock, and people come right throughout the day. Uh, we always stop for prayer at 12 noon uh, and ask everybody just to stand and remember that this is a place of worship. 12.30, we'll have a Eucharist for those who are in the building and who would like to accept the invitation to join us for Mass. Um, we'll have prayers again at 3 o'clock, again, where we ask people to stop and pray and recognise. Then 5.30, we have choral even song. Um, and then on feast days, there might be something at 7.30, Ascension Day, St. Paul, the conversion of St. Paul, um, that sort of thing. I, I know a lot of our, uh, our, our listeners right now would love to know, 
if uh, if you are vested during most of those services, or are you kind of running things from you know from backstage, as it were? Uh, there'd, there'd always be a verger in in his robes of office or her uh, robes of office. Um, so it's even even sacred space, we we're, we're just in cassocks, and that's from a, a, an, a, an identity point of view. If someone ha does need to 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 stop and pause or or needs counselling. The, 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 the vergers and the clergy are just simply in cassocks. But we wear, normally we would wear cassocks only for the said uh, communion services, but for choral services, we would wear our gowns and we would carry our verge. And on Sundays and high days, we'd have those who are entitled would wear their academic hoods and whatever the neckwear they do with you, whether it's bow ties, fringes, jabos, preaching bands, um, yes, uh, dress things up because, you know, like the wedding feast, you want to, you want to give your best. That's right. That's right. You know, you've, you've mentioned a lot of really um, just fantastic things about, you know, the, the, the mission of the cathedral and, and how they are, uh, like I said earlier, sort of being the hands and feet of Christ in the world. Um, and these sound like a lot of really positive things. Can can you talk about some challenges that you think that um, someone who takes over this position uh, will need to be um, cognizant of and 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 be very proactive and solutions oriented about uh, overcoming? It, it depends where you're coming from, isn't it? But but the the, the challenges are um, from the outer world coming in, we, we do have to respond. I've always said that uh, this is my fourth cathedral uh, and we've always, I've always said that we are there to respond to the, the mad, the bad, the sad and the glad. And all of those people have a right to be treated with, with respect um, and meeting people where they are and finding out what scratches where they itch and not just assume that everybody knows what the church is about. There's a great unchurched world out there. So the way we respond to people is, is a charity. We, we have a, 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 a mission to, to street people, a very small mission uh, to street people, but people do come in uh, needing to be, have their wounds cleaned and to be fed and to be given clean clothes and to be sent on to other people uh, who, who can look after them better. So one challenge these days, and especially through the winter period, um, you, you, you're talking, I hate saying the word down and out, but you're talking with the down and outs, those who are challenged in society. And that is a challenge for us to be able to just respectfully help them uh, on, on the way. Um, the, the, the challenges of legislation is another thing. Uh, some things I would have done 42 years ago when I first became a verger, you wouldn't dream of doing now <clears throat> uh, within the bounds of legality and propriety, but things have moved on, and rightly so, uh, because we've got a responsible, not only um, for others, but we've got a responsibility for ourselves and how we, we act and what we are thinking when we lock the cathedral up at the end of the day. Did I do that well? And by having good procedures and good cross checks, that can save you from a, a lot of hassle. Uh, because these buildings are uh, multifaceted businesses uh, as well as being places of worship. And we have to look at all of those social laws uh, and take them on. And of course, that's not just the Verger's responsibility, there's the team of the office staff and the chapter staff and the chapter itself. And uh, different departments are working with different legislations because our works department, who are basically a construction firm, they're dealing with all of that sort of thing as well, or from their level. And I, I liaise with our director of work um, when, when there's always a crossover uh, between the, the sacred and the secular. So there are challenges. I hope you enjoyed the first part of my interview with John Campbell, retiring Dean's Verger at Lincoln Cathedral. John, I want to thank you for such an engaging chat, and I'm looking forward to sharing more of our chat with the VGEC very soon.